From the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology, this is the Bob Harrington Show. Dr. Robert Harrington is the Stephen and Suzanne Weiss Dean of Weill Cornell Medicine and Provost for Medical Affairs of Cornell University. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape. Hi, this is Bob Harrington from Weill Cornell Medicine on Medscape Cardiology and the heart.org. We are taping today my favorite podcast of the year, and that is the wrap-up that I have had for a number of years now with my really good friend and colleague, Mike Gibson. Uh, This has been really a highlight for us where we get to talk about some of the really hot news in cardiology that played out over the course of the year. Uh, We tend to go through the trials. We'll then uh, maybe hit some big topics, a lot of what I will call are either the news of cardiology or the um, policy issues affecting cardiology. And uh, along the way, Mike and I might add a few other topics. You know, typically what we've done is tried to group our topics by things like heart failure, intervention, lipids. This year, I thought what we'd do, and after Mike and I talked, is we're going to walk us through the calendar year. And we'll start with ACC 23, work our way to ESC 23, and end up at AHA 23. So with that as the plan, I'm uh, really pleased to be joined, as I say, by my very good friend, uh, Mike Gibson. Mike is an interventional cardiologist at the Beth Israel Deaconess Leahy Hospital in Boston. He's a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, and he is the CEO of the BAME Research Institute, an academic research organization. Mike, thanks for joining us on Medscape Cardiology. Always my favorite uh, podcast of the year, Bob. You know, um, oftentimes you tell me, if you really want people to listen to it, keep it less than five minutes. But in this particular case, you and I like to really riff on these topics. Sounds great. So ACC 23 returns to, uh, to one of my favorite cities for medical meeting, uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. Always a great uh, town for a meeting. The convention center is stretched out nicely. Uh, You certainly get your steps in, in the uh, New Orleans Convention Center. You also have a great opportunity for uh, for some great food, some great areas for networking. All in all, are you a fan of New Orleans for the meetings? Love New Orleans. It's a city where you get to literally bump into everyone. You know, it's not too big. Cities like Chicago are awful big, so you don't really have that density to, you know, facilitate those interactions. Probably one of my favorite cities for a me. Yeah, you know, mine too. One of the things I love about it, to your point, bumping into people, I think when I go to New Orleans, I get a um, a taxi or an Uber receipt on the way from the airport to my hotel and then back to the airport. Most of the rest of the time, I'm walking around. ACC 23 was a terrific meeting. And uh, I've picked out a couple of things I want to talk about, both in the lipid space, because I thought they were important for different reasons. Uh, the first one was a big trial, clear outcome. Uh, This is the trial that was done in in statin intolerant patients, important group of patients that we all see. Um, And and I thought, well, we can talk about why they um, uh, why they chose and how they chose and define the statin intolerant population. And then there were patients were randomized to bempedoic acid, which is a a new lipid lowering agent, LDL lowering agent. Uh, And some terrific results from this trial showed that that uh, that the the addition of bempedoic acid to other therapies led to a a meaningful reduction in clinical events. Why don't you first off, Mike, give your overall impressions of the trial, but then I want you to talk about the statin intolerant population. Whether you want to admit it or not, or at least patients perceive that they are intolerant to statins. Now, there's some data that suggests it may not be real, but in the patient's mind, it's very real. So we need alternatives to statins. And that's why we're talking about two of them uh, today. They had to either not be able to take two statins in the past or not be able to take one statin and then said, look, I'm just not willing to try a second one. And that's how they got into the study. The drug is metabolized in the liver, kind of a a bit above where a regular statin is metabolized. It's not metabolized out in the periphery, in the muscle, so you don't have that same kind of muscle potential for muscle uh, pain. And as you said, Bob, they had good outcomes. I mean, a 13% relative risk reduction in death and life stroke revask uh, with, you know, about a 1.6% absolute risk reduction. That's pretty good. And then on the triple 15% reduction in death and life stroke. So, you know, for 
for my thinking, this is good news because it's always good news when we have alternatives. And this is a well-tolerated alternative to patients for, for patients with statin intolerance. And I really like the way they did the design because the criticism is always, oh, did you really find people who were statin intolerant? And did you do muscle, you know, did you have elevations of CK, et cetera? But more, they just wanted people to say that I document that this patient has not been able to tolerate statins. So in many ways, it was real life. That's what we're all faced with. You can say, hey, there's no objective measure here. And you can say, hey, there's been trials with the nocebo effect. And yet here, they did, I thought, which was very practical. They said, you know, these are patients who just haven't been able to take a statin. Yep. And it turned out, you know, here's another non-statin therapy, azetamide, but 10% relative risk reduction. Here you're getting about a 15% relative yeah. risk reduction. So I think it stands up pretty well to the other non-statin alternatives. Well, and you also start to get to that picture of, you know, your LDL is really high. You get on a statin, it lowers it by, in some ways, a predictable amount. You're still higher than guidelines, whether it's primary or secondary prevention. You add azetamide, as you said, you get your 10%, uh, very safely done. You add um, something else, maybe now pempidoic acid. So not a bad choice. Always good to have choices. Always good to have choices, particularly in this field. We're really trying to drive LDL lower and lower. Um, along the same line, Mike, another important trial, and it was a phase two trial, uh, but it was with an oral PCSK9 inhibitor. Wow. I mean, we think of these drugs as injectables. What do you think of this one? Well, you know, this was thought to be undruggable. It was thought that you could not develop an oral uh, PCSK9 inhibitor. They screened about 10 to the 16th different variants and found one that might be viable. They made some modifications for different doses, dropped LDL 41 to 61% on top of a statin, very well tolerated. Why is this important? I take a PCSK9 inhibitor. And you know, it's the seventh of the month, Bob, and I haven't taken my PCSK9 inhibitor because I forgot. I mean, my, my alarm went off and it said, take your, but then I got busy and I was at CVCT and I forgot. Now, if I take a daily drug, I'm probably a little more likely to remember. I take all my medicines in the morning and I don't miss them. So, you know, it seems good to give a drug once a month, but in terms of implementation, in terms of behavior, in terms of habits, I got to tell you, it's kind of hard sometimes to remember that once a month injection. You know, Mike, one of the things that I really am interested in, and you and I, I think in the past have talked about in Clizerat, uh, the once or twice a year um, PCSK9 inhibitor. And one of the things that I get excited about is the implementation science. And that's what you're referencing. It's like, okay, we know that PCSK9 is a validated target. We know that. And so here we have an oral drug, which as you said, people struggled to find one and they found it. And now they've shown us that you can drop LDL in a highly predictable way, dose-dependent way, uh, but it's with an oral drug, not the either once or twice a year drug, I mean IV uh, injectable drug, or the once a month drug. Now, what do we do? I mean, I think if, if this shows to have effect in clinical outcome study, and uh, the clinical outcome studies, as you know, are getting ready to launch or are launched, then what I think we might need to do is see how does it stack up from an implementation perspective? Because your hypothesis is a reasonable one, but so is the hypothesis that less frequent with good reminders is going to be better. Yeah, I did a podcast yesterday with a group of people who really are doing the digital pioneering of this whole behavioral modification thing. And I brought up my case and they said, well, we'd have to dig into why you're not, you know, taking the medicine. And I said, but, you know, one, just kind of one reminder is not enough. You've got to have closed loop communication. I told you to take your PCSK9, and I need to say, I took my PCSK9. So it, we've really got to, just like in a cath lab, you don't have to say, give the person an aspirin. You, they say, I gave the patient the aspirin. So we've got to have better closed loop communication. Now, there's a third alternative, Bob, and that is to treat someone one and done genetically yeah. uh, with like what Verve's doing. They're, they're tweaking and editing the PCSK9 gene and getting good, robust LDL reductions. Small study, about 10 patients, but uh, an important proof of concept, a little rocky start. Uh, one patient had a heart attack the day after, another patient died uh, a month or two later. So, uh, you know, 
an interesting start to that area. And that took us off this sort of trip through the year, but I'm glad you brought it up because uh, it's in that thematic area of uh, of lipid lowering, and in particular, of uh, PCSK9 inhibition. And uh, I agree with you, Mike. I think we're going to enter into a phase where we're going to have an opportunity. You probably also saw the clinical trial where with, a, with an antihypertensive drug that's an injectable and you get, you know, prolonged antihypertensive effect. But that really has raised some questions in the device world. I mean, if you can get that kind of blood pressure going with a, you know, every time you go to your doc to get your blood pressure checked every six months, well, you know, you just get this injection to keep it down. That could have really uh, big ripple effects out on the device side. You're talking about things like renal denovation. Yep. To me, again, going back to the implementation science piece and ultimately all the policy pieces and the, and the debates around uh, reimbursement, it's what is going to be most effective for people to not just have therapies that we know are efficacious, but that are actually effective. Uh, you know, and, and part of it, as you've nicely indicated, is that people have to take it. And, uh, you know, and I'm a big believer in the notion as well that do you have to go see your doc every six months for your antihypertension, or could you pop in to your local grocery store or drug store and get your blood pressure measured and have somebody, uh, you know, give you your injection, um, monitor your blood pressure that way? So there's there's so many interesting things that we're going to be uh, excited by in the uh, in the years ahead. All right, fast forward, Mike. That was in the spring. We all, from the uh, U.S. perspective, pop over to Amsterdam for uh, for ESC twenty three. We just talked about New Orleans, another great city to have a meeting in. I mean, one of the things I think that many of us who have been going to ESC for years have enjoyed is that the European society picks some great cities to have their meetings, Amsterdam being one of those. Yeah, I love Amsterdam. Obviously, as a painter, I uh, went to Rembrandt's house and to the Rembrandt Museum and uh, you know, to the Van Gogh Museum, and it's a very walkable city, beautiful city. I, the people are just great. Um, love it there. And we talked about New Orleans being a walkable city. Amsterdam is a terrifically walkable city. ESC, to me, is one of the great um, meetings for clinician researchers. Uh, the emphasis is really on the clinical practice of cardiovascular medicine and, by extension, clinical research. It's not a meeting where we see a lot of basic science. We see a lot of guidelines roll out. We see a lot of scientific statements roll out. Um, there's a lot of how-to sessions. I also love the way that they've designed their um, convention center. As somebody like you who does a lot of communications, you want to talk about that? Because I, I, I like the way they do their sessions, almost like pop-ups in the uh, hallway. Yeah, I do too. And I, I think they're also, you know, pretty friendly to the sessions at lunch. They'll provide lunch, you get to eat lunch and have a session, you know, so that works well. Uh, the the sessions sometimes I find though, if there's two sessions going on at once in the open space and you can hear sound from both, uh, that may not work well, but, um, I do like the setup they had and I, I really thought it was a great meeting as always. I'm always a big fan of ESC. I think they get it right. It's very, very pragmatic yeah. uh, and less kind of, you know, textbooky. It's like, what do I do? And I like that. Is the same with the ESC guidelines, right? They're right. much more about what do I do, correct? And, uh, and we could argue about you know the, the, how much the evidence is really you know studied, critiqued, etc. It is very much a what do I do, and I I, I like the guidelines from ESC for that reason. Right. Uh, a couple of big trials I want to focus on, and one of them is going to lead us into the AHA. Uh, first off, one of the sessions that I went to to look at the results of uh, of amyloid. Uh, with AGTR cardiomyopathy and the um, attribute cardiomyopathy style. Wow, that room was er that that session was early in the morning over the weekend, and it was packed. Well, it should be right. I mean, um, a progressive fatal disease, expensive disease, uh, and you know we have Tefamidus does a nice job of you know stabilizing those tetramers. But here is a new molecule. Uh, Acromodus that really does an even better job of stabilizing the tetramer. So the big question was, you know, well, okay, if it's more potent and more powerful, will it give you the same kind of outcomes that was seen in the Pfizer trial? And the answer is yes. You know, they looked at a win ratio of death, hospitalization, pro BNP, and also, you know, the six minute walk distance. And the win ratio won by 1.8. Another 
words, you know, the drug won 1. 1.8 times more often uh, than the comparator. By the way, some people crossed over. I'm going to ask you about that because, yeah. it's, you know, it's designed as a placebo-controlled trial, but people right. cross over. Yeah, to open label to famitus yeah. in 12 months. So that's tough. Yeah. That's tough. And at 30 months, uh, they won. Now, all the this win ratio stuff, this win ratio is being used more and more in trials. And, you know, it's important when you hear these results, always look at each of the different components of the win ratio. At least many of them were highly significantly beneficial. Death was numerically better. In fact, you know, I think numerically it was a 6.4% reduction, absolute reduction in death. So that was quite good, a 25% reduction in death. So numerically better, hospitalization, BMP, six-minute walk, all highly, highly significantly reduced. When you're looking at the win ratio, always look at how often did you kind of hit those key endpoints up at the top? So between death and hospitalization, those accounted for 58% of the endpoints up at the top. In other words, this was not a trial that was just driven by, you know, BNP or a six-minute walk test. It was really a trial that was driven by hard endpoints and, you know, numerically, I, I think, very, very, very favorable reductions in mortality. Mike, I'm glad that you brought up all those individual points because one of the things I'm hoping we can do for our listeners is to, you know, you and I are involved with a lot of trial work. And uh, increasingly, as you said, in the cardiovascular community, we're using the win ratio more and more. Um, it does allow you, I think, to combine different types of endpoints, as you've mentioned, you know, biomarker endpoints, intermediate endpoints, uh, then hard clinical endpoints, uh, and get a sense, what I'll call globally, what kind of effect is the drug having or the therapeutic intervention having on meaningful outcomes? Why are investigators using this more and more? Well, I'll tell you from my perspective, I think it really has made trials more um, pragmatic and you can get them done. I mean, I'll t cite two examples. One was a bleeding trial that was going to take 600 patients. We got it down to about 120 patients. With so there's sample size issues for sure. Yeah, it's just much lower. You know, a STEMI trial used to take eight to 10,000 patients. We're doing one with 2,500 patients now. It's going to be much more cost effective. That's the good news. The bad news is people don't really intuitively understand what it what a win ratio of 1.8 means. Um, and, you know, the other problem is you're probably going to be underpowered on your traditional things like death and MI and stroke. They're going to be underpowered. You're going to hit on some probable biomarker or surrogate at the bottom. But the key thing is, are they all going in the right direction? And are they going in a magnitude uh, that is consistent as well? You may not hit statistically, but numerically, are they going the right direction with the right kind of relative risk reduction? Well, this is a good example of why when you look at a clinical trial result, you have to look at all of the data and look for consistency. Because even when you're looking at what I'll call a, a, a traditional or conventional frequentist approach, um, and you look at your odds ratios of the individual subgroups, you're not looking to see if one hits and one doesn't. What you're looking to see is, is there consistency? Because biologically, if something works, most things are going to be consistent. They might be quantitatively a little bit different, but they're not going to be qualitatively different for most things. But Bob, one of the advantages here is in a death of my stroke endpoint, you know, those are all counted equally in a composite. Yeah, that's, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, and the other thing is you could have an MI that occurred before the death, but it's the MI that counts, not the death. With a win ratio, death is at the top. The yeah. most important endpoint is at the top, and it really, you're, you're analyzing these things in a hierarchical fashion based upon how important they are. So there are some advantages of it uh, philosophically, uh, pragmatically, clinically, and of course, as I just said, statistically. So uh, an advance in the field of treating amyloid, an advance in the clinical trials field. Correct. All right. So let's move to uh, one that I think will help bridge us to the hottest news coming out of uh, AHA. Uh, and that was at ESC 23, step heart failure, preserve DF. This was with semaglutide. Wow. These, you know, the, the, the trial's gotten some criticism. We're like, well, of course, if people lose weight, or their heart failure symptoms are going to get better. But I think you got to put this into the broader context of the totality of the data. The, the, the GLP-1 drugs are really showing us a whole new area of biology 
that has important clinical effects. Yeah, you know, people said, well, duh, you lose weight, you, you, you walk more, you feel better. I, it's more than that, Bob. I, I uh, met yesterday with, um, you know, a brilliant investigator from the Brigham, uh, Vivian uh, Takedi, and we walked through her data uh, looking at HEF, PEF, and obesity and how it relates to microvascular disease. And, you know, when you have obesity and have PEF, you have a lot of microvascular dysfunction. And she presented some very exciting work at AHA, I hate to jump ahead, that showed that with at least bariatric surgery, you improve microvascular dysfunction. So if this is a half PEF population, it may not just be weight loss. It may be an improvement in microvascular dysfunction that's playing a big role in these improvements. There's no question that the, uh, the, 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 the GLP-1 is an important target now and that the weight loss that accompanies use of these drugs is, uh, is by itself important. Um, but the ancillary clinical effects of better heart failure, less death, less, less heart attacks, all of that really creates this picture that this is a compelling group of, uh, of agents that we still have to learn uh, in the community a lot more about, including some of the mechanistic issues that you know that you and Vivian discussed. E event curves diverge very early, and um, you know this isn't just reducing weight. We're reducing LDL. We're reducing triglycerides. We're reducing hemoglobin A1C. We're reducing blood pressure. We're reducing CRP by forty-two percent uh, in you know one of the trials, and think about it. I don't know the data yet. There is a central action of these drugs in the central nervous system that curbs addictive behavior. Certainly in a poll I did on Twitter, 80% of people who are taking their drugs said, yeah, I drink less often. I, in fact, I stopped drinking. So the other modifiable risk factor is smoking. So it modifies every modifiable risk factor, possibly including smoking, and gives you very quick and early you know, improvements and outcomes. Yeah, it's re re really impressive. And, uh, you know, the cautionary tale is, uh, remember, we studied other agents which suppress the pleasure center, the so-called cannabinoid receptor antagonist. I was actually on the DSMB for those trials and starting to see the um, psychiatric disorders, particularly depression, and unfortunately, even a uh, series of cases of suicide. Yeah. Um, so I, I do think there's a cautionary tale here that we also have to pay attention to as well as some of the longer-term GI side effects that certain patients, you know, have noted. Well, there's a, a dyspepsia that's going to occur in the United States with a hundred billion dollar price tag to the class. Uh, we've heard that story before with the PCSK9 inhibitors. I think the good news is we have so many other agents coming along, other dual inhibitors, yeah. um, triple inhibitors, yeah. giving it twenty-five percent. So competition's going to be good. I think hopefully it'll drive down the price, uh, but you got to realize if you end up with metabolic syndrome and you're over the age of 65 and have diabetes, renal insufficiency, or renal uh, impairment, and some heart failure, you are a $46,000 a year, uh, you know, Medicare beneficiary. It's very expensive. 10 years of that, we're talking about a half a million dollars to care for someone with metabolic syndrome. So yes, the drugs will will be expensive, but there's payment plans thinking yeah. of maybe giving you a bonus if you make it to 65 and you don't have metabolic syndrome, you get a bonus. So we're going to have to figure out how to pay for it. And you know, lower is better, but maybe earlier is better too. There's so many uh, solitary benefits of losing weight, including blood pressure control, glucose control, et cetera. Certainly seems to be a huge advance. And uh, we have to figure out not just the clinical issues, but the policy issues, the reimbursement issues. So I, I suspect, Mike, that next year when we do this run up, run up of the year, we're going to be doing this again. Exactly. All right. We moved to AHA 23, Philadelphia, another pl great place to have the meeting. Some of it is a, a personal bias. I, last time we were there was 2019, just before the pandemic. I was ha was the AHA president oh, yeah. and uh, really enjoyed being in Philadelphia. But I love that convention center because it kind of forces all of us into a common pathway. You see everybody as you walk through it. Your impressions of Philly. I think it's W.C. Fields that said, I once spent a year in Philadelphia. I think it was a Sunday, you know. 
And, you know, I do think it's a great city. I, I, I actually like it. It's a very soulful city, a lot of great food. Um, I, too, you know, reminds me of the old Brigham Pike where there was only one hallway. And yeah. You ended up passing by everyone. So I just sat there and did people watching, and I just conducted business in the hallway. So I, I like that. Yeah, there was some fun stuff there, wasn't there? I mean, they had the uh, musicians playing. There was this very peaceful atmosphere as you entered the convention center for the craziness of the day. Um, I, you know, I, I greatly enjoyed the AHA. Let's pick up semaglutide where we left off, the uh, select trial. Home run was the opening late breaker clinical trial. Yeah, 20% reduction in death of my stroke. Um, all right. In a non diabetic population. I found the mortality data compelling. You know, as a purist, you might say, well, you know, you probably shouldn't have tested that. But you know, anytime you have that endpoint, it's compelling. And um, again, the curves in that trial diverged early, you yeah. know, uh, before you had substantial weight loss. Again, I think hinting at the fact that a lot of this is risk factor reduction, every single risk factor going down. And when you drive it all down quickly like this, the events uh, are reduced fairly early. Yeah, this gets back to your win ratio comment in the earlier discussion that everything was consistent here. And like you, you know, I'm a bit of a uh, clinical trials methodologist. And what I will say to the credit of the investigators, they declared what their hierarchical testing scheme was and they stuck to it. They showed you the data, but they didn't start talking about significance and non-significance. They were, I thought they were pretty fair. Right. And, uh, and it was a great session because in addition to uh, presenting the data, we had some uh, some other sessions, uh, some other presentations talking about the health equity issues, the policy issues, the reimbursement issues. So it was sort of the best of it. You know, we talked about the best of ESC. That was the best of AHA, where you can bring everybody together from different areas of science and have a conversation. Exactly. Mike, let's do two more trials. Um, Orbiter 2. You know, this the, the, the headlines are like, oh, Orbiter 2 saves interventional cardiology. That was after a few years ago. Orbiter 1 destroys interventional cardiology. Man, I mean, this was a terrific trial, and kudos to this group of investigators for doing them. Uh, they're hard trials to do. But are we really going to either bury or resurrect a field on the basis of a couple hundred patients per trial? Yeah, that, that's a little, obviously a little hyped up. But Orbiter 1, obviously, I thought was extraordinarily well conducted. Yep. Not a big difference in, uh, really no difference in, you know, symptom improvement or exercise tolerance with PCI versus medical management. I thought this was a little different. This is really testing more mechanistically, you know, the anti angel effects of PCI. They withdrew the anti angels and when you start off tabula rasa, no anti angels Turns out PCI is pretty good anti angel you know, probably about as good as a single anti angel agent. So I think it's an important reminder that what we do is treat angina with this procedure, and it was effective. When we treat ST elevation MI, we're saving lives. When we're treating coronary artery disease in a stable setting, we're um, improving symptoms and uh, in improving quality of life. And we just have to remember why we're doing things rather than spending our time castigating the procedure, which clearly has its role in uh, different patient populations. Correct. Let's talk about um, Azalea. Uh, now, in, in full disclosure, you and I are very involved with the uh, the factor 11 inhibition field. And uh, this was not related to a trial you and I done, but interesting, right? I mean, a uh, factor 11 inhibitor injectable um, showed that you can markedly reduce bleeding risk relative to, uh, to other therapies. That's what we had hoped. Now we saw it. Yeah, I think this really gave a lift to the entire field. Um, we'd seen lots of results over the past five years consistent. These, this class of drugs does reduce uh, bleeding events. And you know, the reduction here was so marked uh, that it led to the IDMC stopping the trial prematurely. Now, what's interesting here is that this is a monoclonal antibody, once a month injection, People get really nervous about, oh my gosh, you know, am I going to be able to reverse it? You know, it's once a month. Oh my goodness. But a significant, a 66% reduction in major clinically relevant non-major bleeds, a 75% reduction in a major bleeds, 90 some percent reduction, 93% in GI bleeding. Yeah. Uh, now that's versus Riva Roxaban, uh, but uh, seemed to be a much safer alternative. We had... The bleeding safety issues, the DSMB stopped it because it had reached 
the conclusion that they had set out to reach, which was that it wanted to show what the effects were on safety and it showed it. No efficacy data here, though, that, um, that, that really compels us to say, oh, this is the direction to go. And then a couple of weeks after AHA, we see the premature cessation of another factor 11 inhibitor, uh, not the one that you are inv- and I are involved with, but another trial, Oceanic AF, where the D- we haven't seen the data yet, but the DSMB recommended stopping because of lack of efficacy, pointing out to me that yes, we might get less bleeding, but we got to do the bigger trials to show that you've got efficacy too. We were on a high, the, the whole class is looking great. This is a valid hypothesis. And then boom, you know, it was like a gut punch uh, when the bear trial got stopped. I would urge everyone to refrain from commenting on this. Uh, people have said, well, it must have been a big, uh, you know, um, a big miss because it got stopped so early. The trial was rolling very, very rapidly. So there's yeah. reserved judgment on that. But I had a lot to say about this at the CBCT meeting. People then began to go back and look at Azalea and saying, hold on, you know, what about the efficacy with that Azalea drug? I mean, here it's inhibiting factor 11 by 99%, 99%. Was there an efficacy signal there? And then people began to look at, began to look at stroke. Hmm. 0.7%, you know, per 100 patient years for Reva, but 1.3% for, you know, Ibolasumab, almost a doubling. And people were very, very concerned saying, well, there you go. You know, it looks like you see the same signal in Azalea. That's probably not the case. I'm going to urge and caution people not to make those kinds of conclusions. When you look at Reva, Reva in Rocket had a 1.3%. Per hundred patient year, uh, you know, risk of of stroke. So the 0.7 in a very very small study was probably an underestimation, and the 1.34 in a very big study is much closer to what was seen uh, for the ibolasumab in Azalea. So I think that probably gave the investigators comfort that you know uh, they were not causing harm. But as you said, Bob, this is why we do big phase three trials to look at efficacy. So I want you to do a thought experiment with me. We've been down this road before with a safer alternative, and that was 30 milligrams of edoxaban instead of 60 milligrams of edoxaban. And you know what happened? The 60 milligrams got approved because of the primary endpoint, stroke, ischemic stroke, and hemorrhagic stroke. That may be inferior, okay, but do you know what? 30 milligrams of edoxaban had a lower mortality, whereas the 60 didn't. 30 milligrams of edoxaban had a lower rate of death or disabling stroke, whereas the edoxaban, uh, 60 milligrams didn't. So you can, the point, point is, yeah. the trial got stopped early because it was inferior on the primary, but that's much more complicated. That endpoint does not include fatal bleeding, doesn't include subdural bleeds, doesn't include ICH, doesn't include GI bleeds. So it's just the tip of the iceberg. We're going to have to really look at this much more closely. I think we're going to have to look at the totality of the data. I hate to be critical of the designs, but there's guidance from the New England Journal saying you should not lump together endpoints that are going the opposite direction. Ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke, they're going in opposite directions. And you could have non-inferiority with progressively, progressively increasing differences that they get neutralized, and that drives you to non-inferiority creep. There's a lot more work to do to understand this. This is a new area of biology, factor 11 inhibition. You know, we've seen some smaller trials. We're just starting to see the data. We collectively as a community have a lot to learn. There's still some promise here. They, they clearly look to be safer when you look at some of the phase two data and when you look at something like Azalea. But efficacy, we, we still, we still got to show it. What I will say in defense of the class is the epidemiologic data is very, very clear. These people yeah. have much fewer in a way of VTE and stroke. And I will say this, the data is very consistent in the VTE space that the drugs are safer, but also more effective. More effective. Than yeah. current therapy. Yep, absolutely. Right. That's the total knee replacement data with no vaccine. Right. I do think the class will be effective uh, based upon that, but we'll, we'll do the trials and see. 
All right. This has been a great roundup discussion of all of the uh, the three big meetings, ACC, ESC, and AHA 23. I've been with my good friend and colleague, Mike Gibson. I hope you stick around and join us for part two, where we're going to talk about a couple of the news and uh, policy issues of cardiology. So Mike, thanks and stay tuned for the next presentations. Mm -hmm.